they're put on the altar by Jay and Cheryl Monk and Jez and Cheryl Slayton in honor of their father's birthday on Tuesday. J.P. E. Reynolds is going to be 90 on Tuesday. Happy birthday. Thank you. I think we all sing happy birthday. All right, let's do it. Uh, do it.
Let us pray. God, thank you for bringing us together into your house. You've called each one of us to be here. And we thank you that we were able to respond, that your spirit worked among each one of us. And we're grateful that it is a time of worship. But help us not to be able to stop worshiping when we leave this place. Be able to worship you wherever we are, with whomever we're with. And God, we pray that you will carry us to where you need us to be. With the folks that you need us to be able to interact with. To give us the thoughts that we need to have and the words we need to say. God, we pray that your spirit will always work within us. And that we're able to serve you in every way that we can. But also be able to serve our neighbor. God, we're not always the best of folks. We do sin, and most of the time we sin whenever we get a chance. We turn away from you. A lot of times we ignore our neighbor. We think thoughts that we shouldn't have, and we say things to folks, even when we love them very much, that are not the best things to say. God, we pray that you'll forgive us, and that your spirit will work within us so that we can do a little bit better job of living out this life in this place, to be able to to truly fulfill what it is that you created us for, to be in relationship with one another, but also to be in relationship with you. God, we pray that you'll be with all of those that are on our prayer list and those folks that we have on our minds and hearts, that you'll have your healing hands upon them. And then most of all, that each one will know of your loving arms being wrapped around them. And God, we pray that for each one of us and for everyone everywhere, that we know that you are with us no matter what, that your loving arms are, are wrapped around us and your mercy and your grace are with us always to forgive us. God, we pray that we can have at least a little bit of faith so that with your abundance of mercy and your abundance of grace that someday we'll be able to be in your presence. Not just for a moment, not just every now and then, but that we can be in your presence always, forever and ever. God, we thank you. We lift up each one of these words to you. In the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, the one whom we call our Lord and our Savior. And together, we lift up the words that he has taught to each one of us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever. Amen. Let us now worship God with his tithes and our offerings. God, we ask that you use these gifts to do your ministry. Amen.
first verse. Now there was a Pharisee named Nicodemus, a leader of the Jews. He came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do apart from the presence of God. Jesus answered him, Very truly, I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God without being born from above. Nicodemus said to him, How can anyone be born after having grown old? Can one enter a second time in the mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Very truly, I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and the Spirit. What is born of the flesh is flesh, and what is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not be astonished that I have said to you, you must be born from above. The wind blows where it chooses. You hear the sound of it, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus said to Jesus, how can these things be? Jesus answered him, Are you a teacher of Israel, and yet you do not understand these things? Very truly, I tell you, we speak of what we know and testify to what we have seen, yet you do not receive our testimony. If I have told you about earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you about heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven, except the one who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but may have eternal life. God bless the reading and the hearing of his word. Amen. Deanne's grandfather, Fred Loftus, uh, the family all called him Papa Loftus. He lost his eyesight when he was in his 40s. Couldn't, couldn't tell anything. And he lived up at Gowansville. Didn't have an immediate next door neighbor, just kind of there on his own. And after his wife passed away, he ended up living by himself. And I guess when we started dating, he was already around 80 years of age and uh, still lived by himself. He knew every step in his house. He knew every step out, outside of it. And mobile meals would come by and bring him food. And they'd sit it in there on the stove. And on the stove, he could feel the burner. So whenever it he got where he was ready to eat. He could put the food on those burners and the knobs each had clicks on them so he knew what he was setting the stove to. And he usually had a garden, a little small garden outside the house. Well, they had a new preacher at the church, young guy. And he had heard about, about Papa Loftus and wanted to go by and see him. And he, he knew that he was blind. So when the young preacher pulled up there in the driveway in front of the house, he looked and saw a fellow on his hands and knees there in that little garden next to the house. So he thought, well, I'll go see where Mr. Loftus is. So he walked around there and he asked that fellow, he said, uh, I'm looking for, for Fred Loftus. And he said, I'm him. And the preacher said he looked and he said he was pulling up stuff out of the garden, tossing it to the side. And he thought, well, he's, he's blind. What is he doing? So he asked him, Mr. Loftus, what are you doing? He said, I'm weeding the garden. And the young preacher said, I don't, I, I, I don't understand. I mean, you know, how? So he said, so I asked him, how do you know what's a weed and what's a plant? And he said, uh, Papa Loftus kind of raised his head up a little bit, and he said, well, I know what the plants feel like. Anything else, I pull it up and toss it away. But he lived by himself and took care of himself. And you see him walk through the house and he'd walk and he'd count his steps and he knew everywhere that he was. He didn't bump into stuff. He knew everything. It was almost as though he could see. Well, once a year, his daughter from Texas would come to visit and stay two weeks or longer. 
And she, there was no air conditioning, so she would get fans and sit them around in the living room. And then, since people were going to come by visiting to see her, she would move the furniture around. And then she'd get a few extra chairs from other parts of the house, and she would bring those and put them in the living room. And you knew whenever she was home, because all you had to do was look at Papa Loftus, because he was walking around <laughs> feeling everywhere that he went. And he might even have his cane with him trying to tap out and feel the stuff. So in his own home, where it was almost as though he could see, all of a sudden, he was totally blind again. So you knew when she was there. Because he'd lose his sight. Nicodemus. Nicodemus came to visit Jesus. And we're told that he was a ruler of the Jews. He was Pharisee. And Pharisees were the ruling body. And they were more concerned with all the rules and the regulations and all than they were people. So the people, whatever was going on with them, they had to follow the rules and the regulations and all the laws. Otherwise, the Pharisees would say that they were unclean and they couldn't come to worship and they had to do what we could say is penance. So he was also a member of the Sanhedrin. That was the 70 select Jewish Pharisees who were kind of like the Supreme Court that we had. And they ruled over the people who were Jewish. So he comes to see Jesus and he shows up at night. Now for John, John uses a lot of symbolism. But there could have been some different reasons. See this is after John has written that Jesus had been to the wedding feast at Cana and performed the miracle of turning water into wine. And people had heard about that. But also, John's not very chronological. He's trying to get a certain message across. So, according to John, he's already told us about Jesus going into the temple and running out the money changers and turning over their tables. And that would have kind of been the final straw for Jesus. Uh, the religious leaders and the government would have probably gotten rid of him then. Uh, but John's message is a little different. So we've got this thing going on. So everyone by this point has heard about Jesus. They've heard good things. They've also heard that he was a radical and was opposed to the government. So a lot of them want to get rid of him. It's kind of a dangerous thing to be around him at this point in time. So Nicodemus may have shown up at night because it was out of fear. I mean, afraid to be seen with Jesus, especially when you were in his leadership position. Another thing is rabbis, which he called Jesus rabbi, a teacher. Uh, rabbis would study at night. That way, there was nobody there to bother. It was quiet, and they were just there with their, their scrolls, with their studies, and being able to concentrate on it. So he knew that's where Jesus would be, would be there studying so he'd be able to catch up with him and spend just time with him. The other thing is, did you realize Nicodemus was blind? I mean, we're not told that, but John hasn't shown up at night, hasn't shown up in the dark. John used a lot of symbolism. This was John's way using the word dark and him showing up at night was that Nicodemus was blind. He was blind to what life was all about. He was blind to who this man Jesus really was. Oh, he could see with his eyes, but he couldn't, he couldn't tell what was going on. And so he turns around and he starts wanting to converse with Jesus. And so he pretty much asked Jesus, what is it that I need to do? And Jesus says, well, you've got to be born in you. And Nicodemus says, well, wait, born in you. I, I can't enter back into my mother's womb and be born a second time. Well, John had a way of people asking Jesus a question. And Jesus would give them an answer that confused them. 
So they would turn around and ask another question. And then Jesus, John would have him giving an answer that was even more confusing. What Jesus was trying to do, according to John, was to get you to answer the questions for yourself. It's not the same answer for each and every one of us. But each one of us, when it comes to what life is all about and the faith that we have, depends on where you are in life and your personality and your beliefs as to where you fall in there. And so that's what Jesus was trying to do, according to John, was trying to get you to figure out life and how Jesus fits into it. So, Jesus then turns around and tells Nicodemus, you've got to be born of water and the Spirit. Come on, Nicodemus, you're a teacher. You're one of the leaders of the Jews. You ought to understand this. Come on now, water. The Jews knew about water. Jesus says, y'all have been baptized. Water represents being cleansed, being made clean spiritually being washed of your sins. So you ought to understand that. But also, you got to be washed in the Spirit and in, well, water. So it's not just the water. You get washed in the Spirit, and that's power. It is understanding who God is and the power that comes into your life by believing and trusting and having faith in God. So Nicodemus is probably sitting there wondering, what in the world? And Jesus says, well, okay, you understand the wind, don't you? I mean, the Old Testament, we, we know where it comes from. We, we know it blows. We don't know where it's blowing to. We really don't know where it comes from, but it represents God's Spirit. And you're one of the teachers of the Jews. You should be able to know that. You should be able to understand that. And so Jesus is kind of like, okay, let's go another step here. We're back to the Old Testament. You should understand all of these things. What about Moses and the serpent on a stick? Now, all of y'all understand that, right? A snake on a stick? I mean, you know, that's... The Jews... When they were in the wilderness and Moses was trying to lead them out of their bondage from Egypt, they would end up having faith in God. And God would bless them with whatever they wanted. And then as soon as they got it, they would do what? They would turn away from God and want to do things their own way. And so usually something would happen to them and God would allow it to happen. And then... They would finally reach the point of, okay, God, you've got to get us out of this, and God would give them whatever they asked for and would bless them, and it was just a continuous cycle. Well, they ended up in an area, and they had not been faithful to God, so there ended up being snakes everywhere, venomous snakes. And folks would get bit by them, and they would get very sick, or in most cases, they died from the bites. So Moses goes to God and says, God, you've got to do something about this. So God said, okay, Moses, take your staff, stick it up in the center of the village of all the people, and God formed a serpent on the top of that staff. And he said, whenever anyone is bitten, tell them to come and look up at that serpent on that staff, and they'll be okay. And so that's what happened. People would be bitten by the snake. They were going to die from it. They come and they look up to this, which is given to them by God, so they're looking up to God, and they are given life. And Jesus says, remember that serpent on the stick. Now the Son of Man is going to be placed upon the stick. Cross. They fastened him to that cross for us to be able to look at him and to know that he died on that cross for our sins. It was from the mercy and the grace that comes through that cross that we are given life. Because we're just like those people bitten by the serpents. But we are given new life through Christ upon that cross. 
we raised three boys. Josh, Matt, and Sam. Oh. My mom cursed me when I was about 12 years old. I probably did something very much that I shouldn't have done and really ticked her off. So, you know, I got that phrase from a mom back then that said, I hope you have three and they're all just like you. <laughs> so, three boys. Two of them are just like me. The other one is a combination of me and Deanne's dad. And that's probably even worse. Uh, you know, when they were little, prior to that, and y'all can do it, you can walk through your own house, right? Without turning the lights on at night. I mean, not any light whatsoever, but you know it so well, it's as though you can see me in the dark. And you can walk through and you know where the doorways are and you know where the furniture is. And you, I mean, it's, it's not hard to do. You're so used to it. that It's as though you really can see in the dark. Unless you have three little boys. I got up here this morning and I set my drink under the pulpit and the first thing that I saw was Duplo blocks. <laughs> Do you know how much those things hurt when you're barefoot and step on them in the dark? I mean, those little sharp corners and edges and, and a Hot Wheels car. Our little green plastic army men. It's amazing that you can't see where you're going, but in your mind, when you step on one of those things, you immediately know what you stepped on. You can tell the difference between a Hot Wheels car and a Lego block. I mean, every light in your head goes off, and you can see. Now, what is the easiest way to get around that? Wear shoes. Wear shoes. <laughs> Turn on the lights <laughs> so you can see. You know, Nicodemus came to Jesus in the dark, lost, confused, not knowing what to do, where to go, where he's going to end up. But we find out later on that he figured it out. Because when they took Jesus' body off of that cross and Joseph of Arimathea took it and prepared it for burial in the tomb, we're told that Nicodemus was with him. He helped prepare that body. Somewhere along the way, Nicodemus realized that all he had to do was turn the lights on. Because Jesus Christ is the light of the world. He provides you that guidance that you need, that way to be able to move forward in life and to get to where God wants you to be and where he has created you to be. And you know, it's just as simple for us. A lot of times, though, we'd rather just keep on going through life, stepping on Legos, stepping on cars, stepping on little army men, than to just say, Jesus Christ, I want you in my life, and I want you to be my Lord and my Savior. But so much of the time, we just seem just as soon keep stepping on toys in the dark as to reach and flip on the light switch. You know, Nicodemus did. We had that opportunity also. Amen. Front of church is always open for prayer, for commitment, for dedication. Let's stay. Let us join together in our statement of faith. We believe in God, who is created and is creating, who works in others and us through the Spirit. We follow in the way of Jesus, celebrating God's presence, living with respect in creation, loving and serving others, seeking justice and resisting injustice, and seeking out hope and peace. We believe 
of every person, regardless of color, religion, creed, age, class, or orientation, is a child of God. We are connected because we are family. We gather because we all have something to share. We encourage one another and hold each other accountable. But most of all, we love one another. Thanks be to God. Amen. Closing in, selection 526. Thank you.